Okay, we're going to get started. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you, <laughs> as well as Eric Earhart. Eric is an associate professor at the University of New Mexico, where one of our recent PhDs is now in the faculty, Ron, um, Fletcher Richardson, now your colleague. Uh, he also got his PhD at the University of New Mexico with Ed Bedrick, who's been a frequent visitor here and has given talks, so some of you may know him. He's also on sabbatical and working with McKelly and coming uh, the first week of every month. So if anyone wants to talk to him at some point after this, he will be here the first week of each month for the rest of this year. Okay, so you can, uh, you can talk to him. Uh, I got to know him a little bit through our shared interest in statistical literacy, and in 2016-17, he was a teaching fellow at University of New Mexico, which gave him the time and uh, funds to try and experiment in their introductory statistics course to use active learning. And it turned out to be successful, so students actually get better grades when they used active learning. So anyway, okay. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I know, really. So welcome, Eric. Great. Thank you very much, Jessica. Yeah, it's a real, uh, real treat to be to be here at UC Irvine um, and to have the opportunity to spend almost a, a year here in, in pieces. I'd be here more often, but my wife and I just had a baby, so uh, um, it's, I want to be there for a lot. Of <laughs> Change as many diapers as I can. <laughs> so um, I got interested in visualization uh, it, from working in neuroscience as a postdoc because I found so many plots. Uh, were hard to interpret, or were just done so poorly. And so my co-author, um, Elena Allen, and I uh, went on to do a large survey, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a lot about that. But I want to let you know up front that um, adults hate to be wrong, especially uh, a group like us with, with PhDs or aspiring higher degrees. So I just want to uh, let us accept that um, our human abilities are some, will sometimes betray us. And, um, and so I'm gonna ask you some questions that you'll probably get wrong, <laughs> and, and it's okay. It's not your fault, it has to do with our, our um, pattern recognition abilities and, and disabilities. And uh, so, so if I ask you something and you say, I know it's this, and, and you get it wrong in front of everyone, just recognize that everyone else got it wrong too. <laughs> Probably. All right. Um, all right. So uh, many of you will be familiar with, this, with these data sets. There's four data sets here. Um, so I'm, I'm passionate about data visualization because graphs are powerful. There's four data sets here um, uh, down the columns. And there's, here's a bunch of sample statistics, and actually there's many more I could have shown you that are all basically the same for these data sets. And uh, for example, the, the correlation between these two uh, continuous variables, x and y, is, is 0.82 for all these data sets. And it isn't until you visualize it that you realize how misled you, you were about and what assumptions you brought to some of these numbers um, that you weren't even aware of, right? You probably assume that the data looked like this first data set for all of these, and not like any of these, okay? So it's clear how different our understanding is once you plot the data. Um, and so with that power comes great responsibility. So here's an example from uh, the 2005 uh, stand your ground law. That's basically the law that means you can like shoot someone if they walk onto your property. I, I don't really understand it. Um, but this is the number of gun deaths in Florida committed uh, using firearms after that law came into effect in 2005. And many of you, just like I when I saw this, will have incorrectly interpreted this plot as deaths going down. But if you look carefully, at the axis, <laughs> right? So the Florida Department of Law Enforcement is letting us know uh, that 200 more gun deaths occurred after the law, but in this sneaky way that makes you think something else. Right? So, all right. So we're more likely to get things wrong uh, when you go against convention. All right. So our goal throughout this entire presentation. Uh, and in our visual communication lives are to create graphics that convey information accurately and efficiently, right? So you want to get the right answer quickly. That's our goal. So to this end, 
Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, six design principles that uh, Elaine and I have um, sort of uh, summarized from the literature, and and then go into a few uh, special cases that are or, or things to consider um, in in different aspects of visualization. So we're going to basically take this uh, Trivial Pursuit uh, set of wedges and fill them in with our design principles. But first we need our, our base piece. So I'm going to come to design, uh, yeah, um, principle zero for a second. So first thing is communication, right? So who does communication? Is it the speaker or the listener? So I would argue that communication is what the listener does. Because communication doesn't happen just by me speaking. By encoding my thoughts into sound and having you hear those sounds and decode it into meaning, right? It, that whole process has to happen for communication to happen. So we need to design our visual um, communication for humans. So effective graphics will be those that play to the strengths of human perceptual and cognitive abilities and avoid the weaknesses that we have. All right, so what is a graphic? Um, so just sort of what I described. We need to take data, encode those data with certain visual attributes, such as size or color or position. Um, and then your viewer must correctly decode what, you, what you've encoded to get the representation into their mind, all right? So there's lots of ways to encode data. Uh, here's a, a, a set of, just a subset of ways of doing this. I've got a set of values on the left. And I'd like you to look at each of these encodings and try to make some comparisons between the values you see over here um, using these different encodings. And see whether you're getting accurate and efficient decoding. So you'll probably notice that you're, you're having a much easier time with those um, encodings on the right than the ones on the left. And if that's your experience, you're like other people who, who were surveyed by uh, Cleveland and McGill, who after a large set of experiments uh, trying to study this, found this ranking for different visual attributes in terms of their accuracy of decoding. Okay? So position along a common scale, like you've got the x-axis and a y-axis and you put some points on there, that is the most accurate. If you've got uh, position along non-aligned scales, which is not that common, but sometimes you'll see a, a set of axes up here and a set of axes up down here, and you've got uh, different positions, and you sort of have to send your eyeball back and forth to, to make comparisons, that's a little bit less accurate, but still pretty good. Uh, lengths of things ranks number three. As soon as you start to get to angle or slope and areas, right? So angles and areas together, that gives you a pie chart. Um, and then volume or color set. So area is a two-dimensional representation. We're, we're not that good with, with areas, actually. And volumes are even worse because we're projecting a three-dimensional object onto a two-dimensional surface. When we visualize those, we're even worse. Uh, color saturation, that's like grayscale. And then the worst. But the thing that's most exciting is the use of color. So I wanted to keep these, these rankings in mind as we uh, go forward. So the higher decoding accuracy results in greater likelihood of correct interpretation. And hopefully that's your goal in visual communication. So your turn. Given what you've just heard, which encoding would you choose? Okay. Bar chart. Bar chart. This is along a common axis, position along a common axis. Yeah, so that's the most accurate. These relative lengths in the stacked bar chart is slightly less accurate. Um, and then the pie chart is just the worst. Don't even get me started. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things about pie chart, if you orient this, you will get different, you will draw different conclusions, perhaps especially if angles are, or these wedges are close to each other. Um, and if you tip it to make it three-dimensional, um, <laughs> so principle one, 
and code for accuracy. All right, so design your graphics that allow the viewers to decode information accurately. Right. So that's our first principle. Second principle is minimize cognitive load. All right. So healthy individuals can only keep three to five visual elements in their short-term memory. Here's an example. So we have we have movie ratings or movie genre ratings over here. We have film genres, and I'd like you to tell me uh, which has a higher rating: sci-fi or westerns. <laughs> How many people say higher? Or uh, sci-fi is higher? How many people say westerns are higher? All right, so about 50-50. How many of you uh, are still working on this? Because <laughs> your, your visual short-term memory is uh, overflowing. All right, so what... Okay, so what's happening in this plot? We have all these different colors, right? We, and which are in the same order here. Thank goodness they're in the same order. All right, so you can sort of, so you're probably going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You're finding them here. And so what, what many of you probably did is you found uh, sci-fi is one of these blue ones. Maybe you got correctly this one. And then maybe you saw westerns as green. And boy, you see this big green bar here. But that's documentaries. Yeah. Oh. Westerns is there. <laughs> right, so just this is the moment where I, you forgive yourselves for making a mistake. Right, so I'm giving you purposefully giving you examples that are not that unusual uh, that uh, cause these sort of uh, mistakes to happen. Uh, so how can we improve this plot so this error doesn't happen? So there's lots of changes we can make. Here's one suggestion. I'm not saying this is the best one. I've turned it on its side because we read words from left to right, and we don't like to turn our heads 90 degrees. Um, and so I've got the ratings along here. I've also ranked them by their, um, by their rating. In the previous plot, they were just sort of random. They weren't even alphabetical, right? Maybe the order that they appeared in the data set. Um, and so here, you still have to scan, but it's very clear what's higher and what's lower. No mistake there, and no matching up. Right, so visual short-term memory is no longer an issue. All right. So minimize cognitive load. A, a greater cognitive load requires longer processing time and increases likelihood of perceptual errors. Okay. All right. So we're going to design graphics that minimize the work for the viewer, make it easy for them to understand. All right. Uh, principle three, let the data dominate. Um, there's a famous Tufty recommendation here. So in the plot that, I'm, that we're looking at on the left, every graphical element competes equally for your attention. Um, basically, whether it's a data point or an axis or a guide or a label, they all have the same salience. They're all equally as dark. And so it may be hard at first glance to know what is data and what is annotation, right? So in a revised plot, and I'm not saying this is the best sort of uh, plot here either, but the data now are, are sort of the main characters. They show up uh, promin more prominently, and you still have the same guides around to help uh, whatever those things are trying to do for you, um, but they, they play a secondary role. And one strategy to know whether your data are dominating is to squint. <laughs> right? So if you look at it and squint, if the data points are popping out at you, then the data are dominating there. Whereas on the left, it's just a mess of, of stuff. Right? So that's your visual test for that. So we like to think of a graph as, as sort of like a play, um, you know, a, a theatrical play, where you've got the data, which is the person or people, the players that are taking the leading roles, the characters, and then you've got annotations, which are the supporting players. And together, that's the graph. And so we really want the data to take that leading role. And so squinting. And uh, so this goes to Edward Tufte's um, suggestions about maximizing the data to ink ratio. That is, uh, another way to say that is erase non-data ink. So try not to have a lot of frivolous stuff on it. So here's several examples of 
of improved graphs that follow this recommendation. On the left we have, um, on the x-axis we have atomic number for elements, and on the vertical axis we have atomic volume. And there's, this, there's these grid points um, that are, are showing just the intersections of a grid to help you guide where the numbers are. <coughs> but if you squint, you find that it, it almost looks like that's the data, right? Whereas on the right, we've done a lot of cleanup. We've taken the atomic volume label and we've turned it so that we don't have to turn our head. We've simplified the uh, axis uh, labels for the tick marks. We don't need so many. Uh, we still have whatever this model is that's showing these curvatures um, that's sort of connecting the, the dots there. And we've, um, so that part is, is on there, but we've also labeled key elemental <coughs> points here, as well as the rare earth elements that sort of breaks the pattern. Um, so here we've let the data dominate. In fact, I think that th these model lines could even take uh, a, a light gray and, and even prove this further. Um, here's uh, sort of a simple example just to give, show you sort of what can be done. On the left is almost like a default set of Excel or something. Uh, where the grid point, the grid lines are are uh, are taking over, whereas on the right you can see that you can actually create a grid out of negative space. So you're getting as as much guide uh, for for what where the values are without having an imposing uh, grid system. So here's a <laughs> fairly famous example. There's lots of examples like this out there. Um, it's a classic example of chart junk, right? <laughs> so you're probably not looking at the data. <laughs> right, so diamonds were a girl's best friend. This is the average price of a one carat D flawless diamond uh, from 1978 to 1982. Um, we have the, the fishnet stockings are the graph paper. And uh, we, have, we have dollar amounts over here. And um, really what the data are, are like this. You can basically remove everything except her diamonds from that plot on the left and get this. In fact, you can improve this plot even further by just bringing it down to, to zero. So you have a, tr a true zero on there. Um, yeah, so avoid that if you can. <laughs> that takes work to do. So probably you won't make that mistake. So let the data dominate. Design graphics where the data is the most salient feature. All right. Be consistent. So uh, here are two hypothetical fraternities and um, uh, the, the number of meals eaten at fast food restaurants. Okay. Uh, which fraternity ate more meals at Subway? Proportion or more absolute? <laughs> uh, I don't care. <laughs> I guess it's a ill posed question. Okay. Uh, so the point I want to make is this, if you're like me, this is what you did Subway, Subway, Blue, Blue, Seven, Blue, Ten. <laughs> Check my work if I'm interested in doing a little bit extra work. Subway, brown. Brown, seven. Oh, seven and seven. Okay, the same number. All right. So what's happening here? They have not been consistent with their legends. Um, in fact, here's an example of which fraternity ate more meals at Burger King. <laughs> so inconsistencies here, right? Burger King appears on the left, but not on the right. Inconsistencies here um, makes it easy to make mistakes. That's not what you want. In fact, this comes from an example of Israeli elections um, where there's actually even a third category. These are actually the same data from, from, those, from those elections. And they, every pie chart has a different, different frequency and uh, different uh, categories represented. It's a real nightmare. Uh, I don't know how anyone understands Israeli elections. <laughs> um, so design graphics that are consistent with our expectations, both internally for the, for between, within a plot, but also like with our, consistent with our expectations, just like the gun deaths example, where we had reversed the axis. 
All right, Gestalt principles. I love Gestalt principles. There's there's about a dozen or so uh, Gestalt principles, maybe more. Uh, here's I'm just going to show you a couple of these and how powerful they are um, in our brains. So Gestalt principles are the rules for perceptual organization that relate the whole with the parts. Okay. And so on the left, it's almost impossible not to see two squares. Oh, sort of a white square and then a, a black bordered square. But really it's just four of each of these pieces arranged in a certain way. Right? But we see a square because our brains interpret an implied organization just because we are powerful at, at um, uh, pattern recognition. So that's a real strength and we want to take advantage of that. So here's a couple simple examples. Um, we've got two, uh, two panels of six objects. How many groups are there in each of these? So on the left, I'm trying to represent two groups of three. And on the right, I've got three groups of two. Right? And so that's just called the proximity principle. Because all principles are all pretty somewhat, not all simple, but sort of like this. That group, objects that are close together are perceived as a group. Right, so we can use that somehow to, to show organization. Uh, how many groups are there now? <coughs> two. Two. And based on symbol encoding. We've got open circles and gray circles. So that's a similarity principle, that objects are, that look similar are perceived as a group. How about this legend that would appear next to a plot? How many groups are there now? Ugly and terrible. What's that? Ugly Sorry. and terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so two groups, ugly and terrible? Subtle encoding is both ugly and terrible. <laughs> Yeah, so there's, there's dual coding here. Um, there's, there's a shape, a plus, a square, and a circle, um, which might represent three groups. And then there's shadings of those, right? So we have sort of a white, gray, and, and a dark gray. And so just by choosing a, a well, uh, by choosing the types of encodings well, you can actually imply a, a hierarchy, if you'd like, a natural hierarchy. Um, uh, in fact, you may even think of squares and circles as somehow being more similar to each other than the plus signs. And so if you can choose your encoding to, to match up with the characteristics of your data more closely, then that will help your reader make those associations more naturally. There isn't a unique answer here. That's one interpretation of this. So humans have a natural ability to perceive groups and you should use that ability. All right, I'm focusing all my attention to this side of the room because there's a camera on. That's, sorry, guys. <laughs> I, I like you equally. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, our sixth principle is to determine your goal. And because your goal is going to determine what you show and how you show it. So what do I want to learn from the data that I have in front of me? Uh, what are my hypotheses? Um, and how do I represent the hypothesis visually? And then how do I want to communicate the message of the results or something from my analysis? So here's some examples. Uh, if you're interested in differences in means, then maybe a simple thing out of sigma plot like our colleagues in biology and other uh, disciplines use. I plug in your data, you get some means and standard errors and you plot those and you're done. Okay. But if you're interested maybe in the distributions, then we can show more in the same space. So the means and standard errors that are plotted over here, all which are about five, are these points and, and error bars here, okay? So we've also showed the distributions with box plots and a violin plot. Violin plot is just a, de a smooth density plot, um, all right, so that's reflected, so you see symmetry. That's called a violin plot. So what do we learn now? Are the means the interesting thing? Maybe not. In, group, in condition one, we have symmetric distribution. The mean there is a perfect summary of, of the central tendency. Condition two is right skewed. Isn't the mean the, the best choice there? It sort of depends. How about in condition three? The mean is sort of in a trough between two modes. So, so the interesting thing here is that that there's two modes. I want to know sort of something more about that. The mean is the least interesting characteristic. All right. 
So with uh, design with the goal in mind, uh, think before you ink, as we like, as we enjoy saying. All right. So those are our design principles. Now I'd like to. Uh, are there any questions? Why well, I'm going like. All right. Well, then I want to cover. Uh, I, I may end up skipping some of these, but I definitely want to talk about variation and uncertainty, um, and we'll see. We'll see when I run out of time. All right, so this is my favorite topic, variation and uncertainty. Um, as a statistician, I can't state with enough clarity and impact about how important variation, uh, in portraying variation and uncertainty is. So an effective data visualization must remind us that data contain uncertainty, characterize the uncertainty as it pertains to our inferences, and though I could go on and on about this, I think these guys say it best. <laughs> 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 okay, the middle guy's got a big error bar. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so without the portrayal of uncertainty, accurate visual comparison is not possible. Uh, viewers may draw incorrect or un uninformed conclusions. All right. So to understand how um, how well in the neuroscience literature. Um, they are creating graphs, and this is sort of how Elena and I got started on this. We took a survey from uh, six neuroscience journals of uh, almost 300 articles resulting in over 1,400 figures. And we created a huge database and we asked, basically asked the question, for each figure, do they meet these very simple criteria? And we had, we had more criteria than this, but these four were the primary ones that we're focusing on. Did they label the variable they plotted? Seems like a basic place to start, right? Did they indicate the scale that they for that numeric variable? Did they in, uh, indicate uncertainty? And did they tell you what that uncertainty was? If you put an error bar and you don't tell your reader what it is, there's a lot of choices. So let's see how they did. Uh, so the four characteristics are here at the bottom. On the vertical axis is the mean proportion over the 1,400 figures that satisfied those conditions. And we were really liberal with what we would accept as being positive on any of these conditions. Um, we've plotted for two-dimensional data and for three-dimensional data, uh, white and gray bars, and uh, we're plotting the mean in a 95% confidence interval. So for two-dimensional data, they they do pretty well in neurosciences. We're talking about the low, uh, the high 90s for labeling your variable and indicating the scale. I, that should not be surprising at all. You should do those all, in fact, it should be 100%, right? But once you're talking about labeling uncertainty um, or indicating uncertainty, we're down to 80%. So 20% of, of you know, plotting a parameter estimate or something didn't label, didn't indicate any uncertainty in that estimate. <clears throat> and in terms of labeling what it was, um, it was a little bit of a decrease there. That, so we were uh, uh, accepting, as you've labeled uncertainty, if you've put it in the figure itself or in the caption, which means that you might have had to read quite a bit to even find what that was. If you put it in, in another page, um, then you, it, you, you failed. All right, for three-dimensional data, it's even worse, right? 40%, so what is, what is the three-dimensional data that we're thinking of? Um, in fact, I think maybe on the next plot. Something like this. So here's three-dimensional data. We've got a spatial X and Y for slices of, of the brain, axial slices. And then the third dimension here is encoded not with position but with color. So this color bar is an axis. Okay. <clears throat> so that's our third dimension. Let's see, let's see what they did. So did they label their variable? 40% labeled their variable. So two thirds of the time, you don't even know what they're plotting. Uh, did they indicate their scale uh, more, more often? Two thirds of the time. That's basically they put a zero and they told you what the extremes were on their color bar. Uh, labeling uncertainty is hard um, or people don't know how to do it. I'm gonna show you one way to, to do that in a moment. Um, but in this case, if they 
if they plotted t statistics or something, this sort of like signal to noise, so it has a variation in there, so we were accepting of that. Otherwise, no one would have gotten it. Gotten it. Okay? And no one's labeling their uncertainties. So to that end, um, I want to describe how many of you are familiar with this sort of plot? Okay, handful of you. Um, so in brain imaging, uh, we'll off so in this case, we're looking at uh, how what parts of the brain re um, are associated with um, auditory stimuli um, for two conditions. There's a standard condition, which is just a beep every few seconds, just like beep, beep, beep. And after you hear that beep eight or 10 times, you sort of, you sort of acclimate to it. And it's no longer interesting to you. And then there's novel stimuli, like whoop. And when I did that, your, your auditory regions just went crazy. <laughs> um, and so, and so this is uh, looking at brain activation, uh, the difference between novel and standard uh, stimuli. Uh, we, these auditory regions, which coincidentally perhaps are right next to your ears, are the ones that are, that are lighting up here. And these beta weights are um, estimates in a simple linear regression about uh, this, this difference. <coughs> um, uh, okay, and so what is commonly done is if you were to plot the entire surface of, of beta estimates over the structural image, you wouldn't see the structure. So you wouldn't know where you were. So, so there's a compromise here that we're going to threshold at some value, often based on the false discovery rate or some multiple comparison correction thing, and say, okay, anything at yellow and, and above, we're going to um, we're going to plot that, and anything close to zero, we're going to just not plot. And so we get this sort of plot. This is what you see all the time. This is what you could do uh, pretty easily. We have a two-dimensional color bar. So we still have Q, the color, um, mapped to or encoded by the, uh, sorry, the color is encoding the beta value, but we also have opacity, or the inverse of transparency, um, based on um, uncertainty. In this case, we're using a T statistic for our uncertainty. So T statistics that are that are far, that are close to zero, so here's the vertical axis for the T, zero up to five or more. Uh, T-statistics that are close to zero means that the signal to noise, the noise is large. So that's going to be a zero. That's going to be totally transparent. Those places we can see through and we can see the structure. Whereas T-statistics that are very large, we have large signal to noise. And so we're, we're going to plot that as being solid color. So we have just as much information on the right as on the left, but way more. And we're doing it in the same area. So we have uh, sort of our significant regions outlined by black. So those are the areas that you see on the left. But we also see other interesting features, and features that we w should have predicted um, based on our understanding of the brain. For example, there's these blue regions um, that don't pass significance because they they're sort of a little bit noisy across participants. But these three areas in the back and this one in the front are known as the default mode network. And that's, that's the set of regions that are more active when you are performing introspection or daydreaming. Um, it's, it's very likely that many of you will have uh, heightened default mode activation through this presentation. <laughs> okay? um, and, but that's inversely correlated with a task. So when you're engaged with something, your default mode is suppressed and other regions are more active. And so, yeah, there's a negative correlation of this, of this introspection area with, with the task. Um, so this is how we can, we can see more. And it's a way of letting the data dominate when the data is interesting. Okay. Uh, we have uh, some MATLAB code that does this. If you're a, a, a user of ggplot, you can just have uh, two, two axes, uh, two color bars here. You map uh, one variable to color, and then you create this t-statistic and map that to alpha. You're done. All right. <clears throat> Another challenge with error bars, if we go back to the simple case of error bars, is that there's no standard for what error bar to present. <clears throat> so it depends on your question. So does it represent a standard deviation of the sample? Does it represent the standard error of the mean, the range of the data? 
uh, some sort of confidence in interval um, or credible interval? Is it a prediction interval? Right? All of these have very different interpretations. But if I just show you a dot with a bar, you don't know. Okay. So here's some recommendations, pretty simple recommendations. So if you're interested in observational outcomes, then uh, you want to indicate the variation of the data. So if your data are somewhat symmetric, a standard deviation is good. If non-symmetric, um, interquartile range is good. Or if you want to know what the distribution is for an, an unobserved uh, um, observation, the prediction interval is good. Okay, so here is data plotted with a prediction interval, letting the data dominate. You might want the, the, the prediction interval on top of the data, that's fine too. Um, but we've labeled that it's a prediction interval. Okay. Oh my gosh, we've already gone through all these things. <clears throat> so if you're interested in a population parameter, then you want to know um, the uncertainty of that estimate, right? So the standard error of the mean, uh, some sort of confidence interval, Uh, there's an example of that. Now, looking at the plot on the left, it's natural for us to make comparisons. That's sort of the natural question that comes up. Is, are the scores, is the average score for A and B different? So those are 95% confidence intervals. How many of you would say that um, those groups are not statistically different? They, they are overlapping at 10. And how many of you would say that they are different? And how many of you are withholding judgment until you see what the sampling distribution of the difference is? <laughs> okay, so if you do a two sample t test with, uh, or if you construct a um, confidence interval based on the difference, uh, in fact, even though these confidence intervals overlap, uh, in fact, they are statistically different. Um, let all your colleagues from other d disciplines know this. <laughs> okay, so here's uh, uh, one example of, of, of I just talked about how error bars are misunderstood for a bit. So checking whether confidence interval overlap is not equivalent to testing. Okay. Um, so in this example, we have uh, two populations, one with a true mean of zero, one with a true a mean of, of one. We have samples of size 10, and we're constructing 95% uh, confidence intervals for each of these pop population means independently, and we're seeing how they overlap. And on the left is the p-value associated with doing the difference in means, all right? So the, at the top, we have about a 50% overlap and a p-value of 0.1. At 0.05, there's a third, third of the bars overlapping. And of course, right, the proportion that overlaps here depends on many things. So this is not a general rule, this relationship, but I'm just showing you one example. So yeah, a third overlap with, at, at our favorite number, 0.05. Uh, 0.01, they still overlap a bit. It's not until 0.005 p-value that they stop overlapping. So what does this mean? What is our uh, responsibility? It's to interpret our error bars for our readers. And if they're wanting to make a comparison, actually do that comparison and tell them what the answer is so, that they, so your reader doesn't make a mistake. All right, so we've covered these. So just use the appropriate error bar uh, for, for the question that you're trying to um, answer or the inference that you're making. All right, so that's error bars. Let's see. I want to make sure that I talk a lot about color. Um, let me go pretty quickly through multivariate displays because color is sort of the most interesting part for me. So many of us deal with high dimensional data and that could be anything from three or four dimensions up uh, once it sort of gets hard to, to plot, okay? Um, so how many statistics, numerical values, would you need to describe this data set? 
a lot is is a fine number, right? So there's 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 some curvature here. There's two groups. Uh, the the filled in circles tend to be higher than the than the open circles. There's an outlier here that isn't a univariate outlier in either x or y, but it is a bivariate outlier. But you wouldn't see it unless you plotted it this way. And so this is one of the reasons why plotting uh, in this way is so powerful, right? Common way of plotting is a uh, many variables together is a scatter plot matrix, um, where we, down the diagonal you'll get marginal distributions of each of our variables. So here the variable x we can see is categorical, or or at least um, discrete, and then we've got y and x. Y seems to be slightly left skewed. Z is somewhat symmetric, uh, and if you've got two continuous variables, then you can create scatter plots. And you can could, you could actually even create uh, two-dimensional density curves on one of these if you like. Um, and we actually see now that there's three groups. Those correspond to the groups in X. Um, if you've got a continuous and a categorical, you can use, do something like a bee swarm plot or, um, or, or histograms um, or box plots or violin plots. There's lots of options. And lots of software now will allow you to put different styles of plots in each of these areas. So you can represent the data in multiple ways so that you can uh, understand it, whether it's smoothed or the individual data points themselves. Um, if you go in, so one challenge, so one of the challenges with scatter plot matrices is you only see bivariate relationships, right? So how do you represent higher than bivariate relationships um, on, on a flat piece of paper? That's a real challenge. And there aren't a lot of, I don't know. It's a challenge. There are, some, there are some solutions, but everyone has a strength and a drawback. So one strategy is to use a parallel coordinate plot. So this plot, um, for each variable, you sort of go from the low value to the high value, and you line them up. And now every data value, every row in your, in your data frame, is now plotted as a line connecting its, the values on each, of the, on each of the axes. And this had, tends to be useful, right? So different visualizations are, different, are useful for different purposes. This is often valuable for seeing groups or clusters, right? So there's two groups here with different colors, gray and black, and you can see that the grays are behaving differently than the blacks. Okay. Um, it's often hard to tell much more than that, and often data looks much messier than this example. Um, when you, and this is good for about up to you know, three to five or 10 uh, variables. Beyond that, it sort of just becomes a, a, a nest of, of, of lines. Um, a way to simplify this sometimes is to orient all of, all of the minimum values to the center of, of a radar plot. So now we have minimum value in the center and maximum value on the outside, and you're just uh, drawing uh, around the circle. And one way to summarize maybe different populations is to create these glyphs. And, and through, and so that's, so right, so we're summarizing the high dimensional data now. Um, yeah, and this might be one, one way to look at a high dimensional data summaries of how it differs by group. Uh, and then as data gets even higher dimensional, there's other ways of summarizing. So for example, um, something like a correlation matrix um, between variables can show you, uh, um, you know, the diagonal and, and one, off di one set of off diagonals, that's the dimension of this data. And you might represent that with a color bar here, and you might even start to summarize this with a graph, right? So these three up here that have dark areas, high correlation, those are connected by these lines. So you sort of choose a correlation value and threshold, and anything above that correlation value is, is a connected line between, between variables. Otherwise, if it's lower, it's disconnected. So this, this uh, line up here connects these two, and then these two here are, are the correlate, these correlated. So you can represent um, a correlation matrix with a graph, and then you can compare graphs across groups if that's something you want to do. You can also use something like a dendrogram, or you might use a projection of the high dimensional data down into two dimensional data that tries uh, its best to preserve relative distances between the points in the high dimensional space when it's projected on a two dimensional space. Uh, one strategy for this is a T-SNE, 
TSNE um, projection. <clears throat> so you'll recognize so far that I haven't used any three-dimensional -dimension, plots because we are the worst when it comes to three-dimensional interpretations. Um, due largely to uh, occlusion, where you've got one object in front of the other so you can't see things behind, or perspective. If you rotate this, you might get, you might understand the data differently. Uh, now, three-dimensional visualizations are really good if you can interact with them. If you can grab it on your screen and rotate it around, then that's fantastic. But most of our visualizations are static, and that's where it really starts to fail us. <clears throat> so I want to, um, so in this uh, visualization, we've got a reaction time in seconds along the vertical axis. We have different task difficulties, and you can see as the task difficulty increases, that the reaction time also increases. So that sort of goes along with our um, intuition, even though I haven't told you anything else about what's going on here. And, uh, and we have genotype for, okay. Now, what is the difference in reaction time for task, task difficulty three between the two genotypes, double capital A and mixed cap A, lowercase a? So these two. What's the difference in seconds? I have no idea is the correct answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's almost impossible to tell because you've got number two occluding this, this bar here, right? And uh, so you can't, you can't even, you'd have to take out a ruler or something and start to measure and draw lines. And, all right. So one way you can visualize this, right? So this, right, 3D is one of the worst ways we can do this. Um, let's go to uh, saturation. Okay, we know that from our ranking of perceptual decoding that this is not great yet, right? So here's the, here I'll ask the same question. So we've got this color bar up here, uh, 1.5 to 3.5 seconds. Task difficulty three between double cap A and uh, mixed, mixed A's. Now what's the difference between those two colors? Point 0.8. <laughs> Who said that? All right, let's remember that. This guy's a savant, <laughs> a visual savant. So let's choose another encoding along a common axis. Okay, so here's our reaction time. We've got task difficulty. Now we've encoded the genotypes with uh, colors, uh, white, gray, and black. So now we've got task difficulty three. We've got double capital A versus uh, capital lowercase. And now we can all say the same answer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's about 0.8 seconds. <laughs> I'm suspicious. <laughs> you find the demand, why did you? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this, this plot is really good because you can, you can read the numbers, you can make comparisons, it's really easy. Um, um, it does, however, only show you the means. So another strategy for doing, for that uh, allows you to do a little bit more in the same space is small multiples, um, what Hadley calls facets in ggplot. Okay, so small multiples is a way of, of creating one plot that has, that once you understand that first plot, you understand all of them and you can quickly make comparisons between groups. So here we've got uh, the three genotypes as each of its small multiples. We can see the profiles, those curves, which, is, which are the means. But we also get to, in light gray, put the individual observations on there. And so we've now shown you all the data so you can assess something about the variation in addition to the, the error bars that we've put on there. And, and you can see, right, so I've, I've privileged the, the means because that's what I want you to compare, but I've given you everything, right? This is called open kimono in business, sort of a creepy term. Um, <laughs> all right, put all my cards on the table. That's a nicer way to say that. Um, right, so one thing that I really get out of this plot that I don't get here is here because the lines are crossing, right? So one thing about the lines crossing is it is e a little bit easier to make comparisons if you want to say 0.8 about the difference because they're right there on, on the same axis. You don't have to go back and forth. Um, but here I see the, these profiles much more clearly. 
because they're separate and they don't cross over each other. So I see the steep dif difference between difficulties two and three for this genotype, whereas this is much smoother. And that was a little bit harder to see here at first glance because my eyes were a little taken by too much on top of each other. So, um, so this is one of the reasons you might try several visualizations and make comparisons before you decide on a final visualization. All right, let's talk about color. I hate color. I love color. <laughs> um, oh my goodness, I talked about so many things. All right, so color is super powerful. Let's start with qualitative color. So can you distinguish these four groups very easily in grayscale? You know, where, where are each of the four groups? So when you add color to something qualitative, because our eyes discriminate so powerfully colors, um, it, immediately the reds pop out, the red pluses, where they, they didn't really hear. So you can, you can understand the data much more quickly with color. <clears throat> so here's, a, here's quantitative color. So along a, a color bar, right? So here's correlation, mapped from negative one to zero to one. And I wanna ask you, uh, this gray box in the center here, the darker gray, um, what value, is that positive or negative? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? What's this happening? Yeah, yeah. You're at 100 percent so far. So color can really help here because it restores balance. If you choose the appropriate color bar where you've got a neutral zero, so that zero is meaningfully coded, you'll see that that dark, that darker gray box is actually really close to zero. Okay, and is almost impossible over here. Now, when you plot this in black and white, you're screwed again, <laughs> right? But, but when color's there, it, it really helps. <clears throat> All right. There's lots of ways to, to encode numerical continuous numbers with color, right? So there's lots of options for color bars. The ones we just looked at was uh, the blue, white, red, where there's a natural center point. Uh, the one just below it is, is similar in that it's got a gray center point. Um, and it, and it heads off in two different directions. Uh, the one on the bottom is the MATLAB standard jet color bar, where green is zero. Uh, what, what's the top color bar useful for? Well, it, it begins and ends with the same color. So anything that's sort of periodic uh, or cyclical, um, uh, you know, angles, time of day, that's, that's a good color bar for that. And so you want to choose a color map that's aligned to the nature of the data. Um, so each of these color bars are trajectories through a color cylinder. Um, and so I'm going to tell you about HSV, uh, hue, saturation, value, color space. The bottom of the cylinder is completely black. And so if you start at A, which is at the center bottom of that cylinder, that is black. You go up the center, you are increasing the value. And so you go from black to white. That's our gray, grayscale color bar from A to B. As you go from the center, so B is white. As you go out from the center, you're increasing the saturation of a particular hue of one of the colors. And you'll get um, the darkest colors on, their, on the edge there, on the rim. And then as you go around the, the rim, that's the hue. So you get all, all the colors that way. And in this cylinder exists every possible color. What I've labeled over here on these color bars are the different tra trajectories. So D to B to F is the blue to white to red color bar. Um, the, the uh, let's see, let's do the jet color bar. H, <coughs> H is sort of a dark blue to, to D to C, which is a light blue, over to I, which is this sort of medium green, up to G, a yellow, over to F, and then a dark red down to J. And so that's how you produce a color bar. Um, or that's one way of thinking about producing a color bar. But I, I, before I did this, I never thought about how to produce a color bar. <laughs> um, but color is tricky. Because the differences between uh, two quantitative values 
represented in a color bar will deceive our perceptions, or will be deceived by our perceptions. So here's two greens that have the same distance as the orange and yellow, but we would never have seen that. It's not our fault. We forgive ourselves. <laughs> we blame the person who made the color bar instead. <laughs> in fact, there is, a, there is a color bar in MATLAB, in the, in the 2017 MATLAB, that actually tries to improve this so that equal distances are actually perceptually equal. But it's a very, very hard problem. Um, same thing with these blues. These blues are all the same, right? These reds are the same. There's big differences. So you have to really be, be concerned. So I'm just going to say a couple more things and I'll end. Um, our perception of color is, based on our, is biased by local contrast. So many of you will have seen this plot on the left before. Um, we've got a square labeled A and a square labeled B. We want to ask whether, which one is darker, okay, A and B. And then on the right, uh, one that I came across during this work, uh, how many colored chickens are there? Right? And there's clearly four. There's obviously four. <laughs> but just as on the left, these two grays are, are the same gray and are distorted in our visual perception due to local contrast, you know, what colors are next to it. Here, these two magentas are the same and these two light greens are the same. But no matter, even when you know the answer and you make your eye go back and forth, you don't believe it. <laughs> It's okay. So it's just, it's just important to be aware of how, of how we can be tricked. It's not our fault. Um, not only that, but you know, uh, about one in 12 um, men are, have color blindness. It's much more common in, in men. And, uh, and so if you can see this number in here, uh, then you do not have red, green color blindness. Um, but you know, a substantial enough yeah. proportion of people do that you want to accommodate them and let them appreciate your visualization also. Um, and one way to do that is to choose color safe palettes for, uh, for people with, with different uh, visual abilities. And uh, Color Brewer 2 is a nice organization for choosing that. These color palettes are also available in ggplot. Okay? Um, what so, what are the numbers? Oh, <laughs> uh, the number is 74. Yeah. I'm revealing, you, re revealing to you something about my DNA. <laughs> so when you use color, make sure that the benefits outweigh the costs and be really uh, cognizant of that. So th there's things I can tell you about supporting details. Um, they're important also, and I can talk to you about ac labeling axes and banking the aspect ratio of your plots and uh, put it, adding annotations to your figures and not overdoing it with significant <laughs> digits no matter what your software <laughs> defaults want to do. MATLAB is crazy about, about number of digits and, and you know, so is R. So you know, make sensible decisions about, about how many digits to, to include. And recognize that the process of, did, of doing visual communication is iterative. You'll make decisions, you'll refine it, and, um, and uh, it's always good to, after you've created visualization, to give it to someone who's naive with what you're working on and ask them to read and interpret what they see and see if what you intended to communicate has been interpreted correctly by your, by your audience. Because our goal is to create graphics that um, that portray information accurately and efficiently. All right, so those are all the things, and those are all the things we talked about. Well, okay, thank you. Um, there are some students that have a class in a few minutes, but maybe one or two questions, and then the students can go that have a class. So any questions? Maybe a recommendation. So I do a lot of spatial mapping where you'll have point estimates and you're interested in, say, parameter estimation is your goal mm -hmm. you're thinking about um, your different scenarios. So, you know, I mean, I've, I've always resorted to basically doing parameter estimate to an half percentile, 97 or 97 half percentile, right, on, mm -hmm. on confidence interval mm -hmm. to kind of show those things. But they're very hard for people to visually match up. But 
it's a way to try and quantify uncertainty in parameter estimates. So I think it would be hard with the kind of the bi-directional color bar that you had shown, the two-dimensional two color bar, but you have other suggestions that people use to yeah. represent spatial point estimates. Yeah, so the question is, how do you represent variation or uncertainty in, in uh, spatial point estimates? Um, and so the bi-directional color bar, you're saying, is, is hard because you've got individual points that you care about. So you're not doing a surface of color. Right. <sighs> yeah. or, or, or maybe a map to simplify it. Like you have a map of, and of state with counties, and for each county you're plotting like disease risk or something. Yeah, so are you thinking of like a chloroplast map, where you've got shaded regions? Or <coughs> are you thinking of, at this point, I've got a point plus two. Really, really a smooth shaded region. A smooth shaded region. Yeah. Yeah. So um, a smooth shaded region. So actually, so I actually don't see how it's that much different from this, but maybe it's worth. Well, so you want to actually represent the upper and lower bounds. A confidence interval, for example, like a point less confidence interval. Yeah. So, so not just your uncertain. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. Uh, yeah. That is a. That is almost an impossible problem. It's something I've struggled right? with for a <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. three plots, yeah, yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hope that people can understand. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so three plots where you've got the upper bounds, the, the estimate, and the lower bound is, is, is one strategy, right? Um, it's hard to get those three numbers together. Exactly. Um, and so I, I don't know how to do that. And so, so the strategy that I use here of basically quantifying the width of that interval with, with transparency um, is is what we thought of to get it into one, but hard problem. Okay. Yeah. But doesn't the transparency go with the that grouping thing where you go? Oh, well, then I, I see the same color. It, it, it. Trans say that one more time. Doesn't the transparency go? So when you change the transparency on the reds, where is it? It, it looks like. You just have a group, and if you didn't have those black lines to mm -hmm. outline your reaches, you might go that. When you change the transparency on your on the reds, you may not be able to see the the the, the confidence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that you're, you're grouping that as a red together, as opposed to seeing the confidence. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. I I think it's a very hard visualization problem. And I don't have an answer. I think most people just give the point estimate, to be quite honest. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't live with that, so I have to give it three. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, before well, we do more questions, time. I'm going to let the students go who have class, so just so you don't feel awkward getting up and walking out, so go through that class. Go and then continue with questions. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, uh, so first, well, thanks for uh, recognizing the importance of coral blindness because I had our two collaborators uh, who is a color blinded, and every time that I was presenting a, in a, a talk, it was like, I, I cannot get what you did, right? Right, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Elena's, Elena's PhD advisor was color blind, so oh. she needed to, yeah. yeah. Uh, but so one thing that uh, uh, I noticed that basically you killed uh, the heat maps, uh, the grayscale heat maps, right? Uh, which are often used uh, in the genetics and other, and other uh, uh, context. Um, so but the issue with the uh, however is that uh, you know color map uh, it, I mean it maps color, color it maps they cost money right if you mm -hmm. want to publish them that's right so yes. what would you suggest for uh, do for doing a uh, grayscale it map right yeah so the question was uh, um, oh, now I can't find where it is um, yeah so here we go so Michele, uh has uh, said that I've c killed the grayscale heat map, but if you want to avoid publication charges for colored pages, what's the alternative? I so so one is to one is to live with the grayscale uh, heat map. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a, I don't have a good answer for for what. To, yeah, do you? Could you pixelate the positive versus the negative? So it yeah. looks like dotted. So you got some other visual feature that indicates the negative and positives. Yeah, so uh, some sort of texture, like what you're saying, mm -hmm. or you could outline the boxes that are negative. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
I, I, I think it's not going to be, it, it's going to be hard to be successful if, in, especially for correlations or something like that where you've got a, a natural zero, right? So if we didn't care about zero, it being in the middle, if we only had positive numbers or only negative numbers, then I think it would be a little bit easier. Because, um, because, um, right, zero has a, sort of a special meaning here. And so that's a real, real problem yeah, when it's grayscale. Yeah, yeah, the particular case, um, yeah. But yeah, I don't see. I think you, I think you ask your department chair to, uh, <laughs> to pay for some publication charges. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> Get another grant. Do that. I have a question about your small multiples. Yeah. Go back to that slide. Uh, let me try to find it. Is it over here? Oh, it's back here. Uh, let's see. So the images are oh, don't, oh, So yeah. So um, the task difficulty is a discrete variable, right? Yes. So uh, if we're trying to erase non-data ink, what, what like I, I'm conflicted about it because like wouldn't you want to get rid of the lines connecting your data points? I see what you're saying. So the the light gray points are individuals, right? And so the, it's meaningful to connect those dots because mm. they're they're blocks, you know. They're very. I see. Yeah. Um, so I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, because the lines themselves aren't data; they're sort of an, 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 an type of annotation that help us uh, view all four points as a group. And uh, so, if if seeing those as a group is useful because it helps us uh, uh, see how these profiles are different. So if, if that's your goal, then connecting the, the dots helps. Um, if you have a different goal, then you may not want to connect it. So it, everything comes down to what, what's the information that's, that you want to be most salient in your reader's mind. But yeah, it's a good point. Yep. With the radar plot, or actually the one uh, above the radar plot? Yeah, let me try to find that. Is, uh, it's on the high dimension. So you said it's usually not as clean as in the example that you gave. And does it ever depend on the way that you organize, uh, say, those axes? Oh. Like, or is it going to pop out more in your experience for certain organizations? Or is it just going to be if the groups appear well with one organization or one ordering that they should with another? Yeah, um, that's an interesting point. So. Uh, the ordering of these axes, either on the parallel coordinate plot or the radar plot, is, is arbitrary, yeah. perhaps. So you may want to think about whether one ordering helps you, um, uh, sort of if you think of these glyphs maybe as summaries, you, you know, which, if you're thinking about discriminating, what, which of these variables uh, are different between, between these groups? Is there an ordering that helps you see that? Yeah, that's my question. Yeah. So one strategy might be to uh, order these by, you know, if you sort of think of a, maybe you've got a baseline group and you can calculate their mean or median, and maybe you order these uh, in decreasing uh, order based on the median of your baseline group. So then you'll have, you'll have, a, you'll have a, a radar plot that sort of starts out here and then sort of spirals in. So that's your baseline. And then relative to that, Sort of simple to to digest uh, group, then you can see differences from that. So a anytime you can take something that's that's wiggly and make it flat, mm -hmm. <laughs> that'll help us see differences. Okay. So that's one strategy. Yeah. Any, anytime you can take take a, an arbor, arbitrary choice and make it purposeful, I think you'll you'll gain some ability to interpret it. Do you have any suggestions on like 2D projections like PCA and TC for when you have like a lot of data points and you want to show multiple groups like with colors and with points? Do you suggest like colors and points or grayscale and different shapes or what do you think is the best? Okay, so yeah, so we want to do some sort of uh, projection down onto two dimensions. You've got, um, so the number of variables doesn't really matter too much. but. The number of categorical variables you might want to represent is maybe the challenge. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, like if you have, you know, you want a group red and blue, but you also want to have like triangles and squares in the red and triangles and squares in the blue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of 
Right, so we've got uh, you know, different people with different color eyes and we have different genders and we have uh, whether they like pizza or burgers the best or whatever, right? And so you've got multiple, so right, so it's, it's going to be hard, right? So we can't, we can't do both about uh, de lowering our visual short-term memory load um, and choosing lots of different encodings that's going to parcelate these different categories among different variables. So it's a, and there's only so many encodings that we might have. So we have color, we have shape, we might have size, we can have uh, opacity, sort of how dark it is, but th even then, you, if you encode something to be lighter, uh, then you reduce the salience of that group relative to others. So that's maybe something you don't want to do. So maybe use color instead. Oh, I made it. Did I already say color? Yeah, so I'm already running out. <laughs> so it's, I think it becomes challenging to represent too many um, combinations of category, of categorical variables. And at that point, you need to just make some choices about what are the, what are the features that you really want your viewer to see and which ones can you ignore. Alternatively, maybe you make several plots. You have the same projection, so the points are in the same place, but then you, you visualize that uh, differently. Um, good luck. Okay, I'm gonna cut it off here. If you have more questions, you can come up and ask Eric. Thank you again, Eric. Thanks.